It's none other than Cyrano Jones, the triple trainer himself. Gotta scam them all. And he's got a boatload of pink John Waters approved tribbles with him. Welcome to Task Blasting, our series where we explore the weird and cheap world of Star Trek the Animated Series, the chronically underwatched, forgettable part of Star Trek fandom. Today is a dark and fuzzy day. It's a triple episode, everyone! Run alert! Why do they keep coming back to this same furry well? Well, when this came out, this was only the second four-way into the triple lore. Unfortunately, we've all had to endure at least one triple episode in every single Star Trek iteration. And it seems like way more. Only Voyager was spared, God bless him. But uh, here we are, and trouble with troubles we must. Ugh, fine. But I'm here under duress. More Tribbles, More Troubles starts out with the most lumbering slow shots of the Enterprise floating around pointlessly ever seen in Star Trek history. Wonderful. Zero seconds in, and we're already padding the runtime on this stinker. The Enterprise is escorting two robotic grain ships to Sermon's planet. Riveting. The ships are kind of unique for Star Trek, uh, especially at the time. The concept of uncrewed long-haul ships is dry 70s science fiction at its finest, and I am here for it. It's things like that that make this show really stand apart from its peers at the time, by being boring. The Enterprise has been assigned to escort two robot grain ships to Sherman's planet, which has been struck by crop failures and famine. Sherman's planet is having a tough time uh, with the growing and all, and they are really looking forward to this shipment of, uh, quite, um, quite, uh, uh, Go on. Quinto Triticale. They're hoping to turn it around in the fifth sequel. Quinto Triticale. Right. They're getting a big old box of Zachary Quintos, but on the way there, they run across a Klingon battle cruiser, giving hell to a little scout ship. I feel like Zachary Quintos are something you'd sort of like, but they're pretty forgettable. <laughs> and if that's not enough, Kirk's acting like he found a Black Friday sale on Klingon WMDs. Observation may confirm a rumor that the Klingons have a new weapon, type so far unknown. This guy is super bloody minded. Does he only think about battle? Jeez. Sulu and Spock give us the play-by-play -play when the Klingon cruiser suddenly opens up on the little scout ship. Kirk hails the Klingons, to no avail, and sets course to intervene. They're gonna beam up the pilot and start an intergalactic incident. Yay! All in a day's work for Kirk. Scotty locks on and yanks that lever like a pro. Meanwhile, the Klingons are blasting and blasting, finally scoring a good hit on the little dinghy. Kirk tries so many times to get the Klingons to respond to his hail, only to meet with stony silence. They ain't letting up though, and the bangers continue with gusto. Scotty finally gets a good bite with the transporter, just as the little shuttle is annihilated. Pretty sure that's how the transporter works, the explosion kinda fuels that last little bit. They're crossing their fingers the transport went through, and we get to see some classic angry muttering from Scotty. Klingon tactical blood blast decalibrated the integration parameters. Which permeates this episode. The beam up part of the transport was a success, but Scotty does have a little trouble putting everything back together again. You know when the uh, TSA goes through your luggage and just uh, fucks everything right up before uncapping your toothpaste and kicking it down a flight of stairs? Oh, intimately. It's like that, but you could end up with a foot where your dingle used to be. I'm sure somebody's into that. Think of it like uh, re-rolling your character sheet, only into a pile of limbs. Back on the bridge, the Klingons are approaching, setting alarm bells off all over the ship. The battle cruiser starts emitting a big old fat beam from the front of the ship, enveloping the Enterprise in a blue-white spirograph mess that sounds like someone put wind chimes in a tornado. Kirk clocks this as the new rumored weapon right away, and Spock gets a chub analyzing all the data he's getting on it when he's cut off by the arriving blast. Okay, pause, wait. Look at this shot. They 100% forgot to put the shaking effect on this. Look at everyone. Either that or they just wanted to shame the bridge crew's terrible posture. Scoliosis on my enterprise? It's more common than you think. The secret Klingon weapon actually packs quite the punch. The Enterprise is sitting pretty much dead in the water. The field they're in has made the ship pretty much useless. No phasers, no engines, 
no service. Spock speculates that the Klingon weapon must be a huge power drain on them. And down in the transporter room, Scotty is having trouble reintegrating whatever it is he beamed up. The Klingons finally call Kirk back after his 14 crazy ex-boyfriend voicemails. Ah, oh, Captain Kirk. Release my ship. The gen on the screen actually looks super friendly and happy to be there. Pretty weird, my guy. They're ready to talk turkey and lay it all out. They want the pilot, and they ain't letting the Enterprise go until they get him. They call him an eco-terrorist, ooh, and threaten to board if Kirk doesn't give him up. Kirk gives a little tough guy clap back, but the Klingons know it's just puffing up his chest. Ora gets real close and personal with Spock, whispering to him in his pointy little ear that the grain ships are getting away from them, just a little FYI. You know, their real job. Kirk overhears the pillow talk and drops the comms with the Klingon captain. His Kirk brain starts a chugging, and he realizes that they're still in control of the robotic ships. This is why he's in the big chair, folks. Kirk may be a bit of a loose cannon sometimes, but I'll be damned if he ain't a clever bastard the other times. Kirk doesn't even bother with the tutorial level of war tactics. He goes straight to the final boss move. Have them ram the Klingon ship. Spock reminds Kirk that the grain is actually super important, but uh, Kirk sees no choice really. Plus, this might be his only chance at a threesome with Klingons. Sounds painful. And those colonists that need that grain, let them eat cake. <gasps> How dare you, you royalist swine. Shh, Kirk will hear you. He's too busy pulling Captain Koloth back up on the FaceTime and they tough guide each other a little more before Kirk starts hurling the two ships right at them. This makes the Klingons split their beam up in an attempt to thwart the attack, shutting down the Klingons' hold on them, and the Enterprise is free to float through space once again. The Klingons open up with traditional armaments on one of the grain ships, giving it a good shiner and stopping it in its tracks. Spock's already calculating the Victory Party playlist. Lots of Vulcan liar. He thinks the Klingons are retreating like a cat from a cucumber. Scotty takes the breather to finish beaming up his bag of particles and is joined by the big three down there in the transporter room. As the contents of the pilot seat materialize, Kirk is flabbergasted by the portly round shape appearing on his ship. Flabbergasted? More like Kirk's been vaping some serious space juice in the turbo lift. That's not just a federal offense. That's a Starfleet scandal, Jimmy. Cyrano Jones. And he's got triples with him. It's none other than Cyrano Jones, the triple trainer himself. Gotta scam them all. And he's got a boatload of pink John Waters approved triples with him. They have a nice little catch up with Cyrano and get ready to stick him in the brig for his unlawful dealings with the little chirpers. Cyrano claims that these are safe triples. They're spayed and neutered in accordance with the wishes of Bob Barker. Uh... I would pay any amount of money to watch an episode of the Klingon version of The Price is Right. The Price is Your Life, hosted by Daru Kare. The Showcase Showdown? More like the Showcase Beatdown. So Cyrano makes a big deal about how these things don't even reproduce. He hired some back alley geneticists to tangle with the Abigabas. Kirk asks the real question here. How did Cyrano escape his fate on K7? To which Cyrano produces from his pocket his little ace in the hole. No! A triple predator called a glama. Ugh, this thing looks like the cheap end of the worst fresh fish market you ever saw. It looks like a Lovecraftian fidget spinner, and it just loves to munch on a triple, which he demonstrates to the skeptical crew. Watch. He falls on it like a guillotine with teeth. Either McCoy is happy there's no mess to clean up after that little display, or he's getting just the worst kind of ideas for leisure time. Well, at least it's neat. Kirk gives Jones the third degree, and he plays stupid for a good long while before Kirk pulls it out of him that he sold the Klingons some of this furry product, and they have a deep abiding bias regret. Kirk and I am pretty impressed with Jones's salesmanship. I imagine selling a triple to a Klingon must have involved very sophisticated bullshitting indeed. Cyrano is happy for the rescue, but less thrilled when Kirk starts quoting Federation mandates and local code violations at him. He sticks Jones in a space slammer, while Doc McCoy gives the little flamingo testicles a once over. Or irradiates it? I don't know. All his doohickeys kind of look and sound exactly the same. McCoy's diagnosis, these Tribbles aren't baby factories. 
they are just little puffballs on the keto diet, always eating, never shrinking. They circle back to the Klingon weapon, since the heat is off vis-a-vis -vis triples. Spock points out that the weapon has a big old flaw. It disables the ship it hits, yes, but it also disables the attacking ship. What a rip. The Enterprise crew's sassometer is at an all-time high. It's like they all took a masterclass in snark. Aye, and if that's true, then it's a weapon that leaves them as helpless as it does us. I believe I just said that, Mr. Scott. Yes, please. I need more put-upon, bitched-up Spock in my life. I am sure about this. Spock concludes that Cyrano must be the key to all this. They seem to want him back very badly. To, you know, murder. To murder. McCoy leaps to Jones' defense, but Kirk keeps up the sass and lets us all know what he thinks of that dumb shit statement. Scotty tells everyone they've rescued as much grain from the damaged robot ship as they can and brought it on board the Enterprise. Making life aboard the ship a living hell. There's drums of Quintos everywhere in the hallways and holds, and they still got the other ship stuff to worry about too. Plus the tribbles on board. This day is making Scotty want to crawl into a bottle of green and never come out. But they disconnect the robot ship and carry on their merry way. But they're confronted almost immediately by Koloth, who is pulling up on them faster than a road rage sucker mom in an enormous SUV. The size of it makes her feel safe. Kirk tries to bait Koloth into a fight with the Enterprise, but Koloth doesn't fight. He goes straight for the remaining grain vessel and deftly disables it without harming the grain. Spock is impressed with Koloth's marksmanship. The Enterprise and Cruiser face off again, dropping some big old blamos on each other. And scratching my submarine movie itch. I'd love a good face off between two captains and silent floating ships. Gotta say though, Koloth is being all kinds of nice here. He's gotta be the most declawed I've seen a TOS era Klingon. Disabling shots? Diplomacy? Yeah, and it took like 12 shots to nail that shuttle earlier. He must still be reeling from being burned by Cyrano really bad. I'm sure it's a great dishonor to get bested by this spherical circus clown. And have you noticed they only ever show Cyrano with his hand in his pocket? What's he got in there? What's going on? The Klingon ordinance really did a number on those buckets of grain. The hallways are an absolute mess. Not only that, the tribbles are on top of that grain like stray cats on a dead hobo, squealing and growing and being as pink as possible. Tripling this moment's troubles, the Klingons open up with their new gotcha beam, trapping the remaining robot ship. Spock sees through it and lets Kirk know what's up. Aren't you going to sit down, sir? I think I'll stand. Jeez, what's up with these two? SAS levels are above nominal operating temperature. Spock flippantly suggests that they throw triples at them, but Kirk takes that one to heart and puts it in his back pocket. That'll teach Spock not to mouth off so much. Scotty's eye is on the ball, however, and he lets Kirk know about this triple situation. They're eating up the spilled grain, and they are growing up big, strong, and fast. They march Cyrano to the bridge because they've lost track of the Klingon ship completely, and Kirk is starting to get desperate for one thing to go right in this episode. Cyrano is blissfully gaslighting Kirk about the Tribbles when one shows up in his captain's seat. The rapidly growing Tribbles are pissing Kirk off, and he now knows what Koloth meant by ecological sabotage. Say it like Kirk. What? You know. Sabotage. Ha! Ah, bones burst in with Tribble news, but Kirk has bigger fish to fry. Like this one Tribble that keeps trying to assume command? Geez, what a little tryhard. He's not even an ensign yet. They drop their robot cargo and turn to face Koloth, ordering Cyrano back to his cell. Kirk fires first this time. Looking at you, Han Solo. Launching a photon torpedo at the battlecruiser. But Koloth fires his disabling beam detonating the torpedo and snapping up the Enterprise once again, trapping both ships and forcing Kirk to give him the time of day. Yeah, what the hell, Koloff? A perfectly measured response to Federation aggression? This is not on model for Klingons. Koloth asks for Jones again, and Kirk just hates to say no to him. Kirk would 100% leave this dude to his fate with him if this was not a comedy episode. They cut off Koloth, and Kirk relinquishes command to the new captain, Chirple McFuzzy Bottom. Kirk and Koloth are on the back foot now because of Jones. Kirk is on plan B, while the Klingons are all the way down on plan C at this point. Or whatever the Klingon equivalent of that letter is. Kirk's gone full plagiarist to take Spock's triple bomb idea. 
He's about to send those furballs to the Klingons like they're unsolicited chain emails. The line for the men's room on Kolos' ship is getting kind of wild. The door bursts open to reveal the guy they were waiting on has been gobbled up by a swarm of nasty furballs. And that's pretty much how I imagine all male locker rooms are. The Tribbles start making their way throughout the Klingon ship. Every nook and cranny is going to be stuffed with purple fluff before this day is over, believe you me. Kirk calls up Koloth just to see the look on his face, and neither he nor us is disappointed. Koloth face palms harder than Picard, and lays it all out for Kirk. The truth. That horrible little Tribble Hunter Jones had in his pocket? That was the real deal all along! That's a Klingon genetically modified bioweapon. It lives for triple flesh, just like the original creator. And the Klingons want it back, more than ever now. And it's the only one in existence. They need it real bad to save the planet that Jones was fleeing from in the first place. He's left a huge mess and stole the only way to clean it up. What a jackass. Eh, he's no hairy mud. Kirk can't believe his luck. Koloth only wants the glomer back? He can definitely do that. They beam the glomer over to a relieved Koloth without hesitation. After some bullshit arguments from Cyrano, that is. This guy is like a sovereign citizen jerk with a space suit, talking about how he salvaged it fair and square. Though, imagining this tubbo sneaking around in a Klingon laboratory is pretty funny. Scotty calls his bluff and threatens to send Jones over with the little beastie. But if you want the little beastie that bad, Mr. Jones, we'll transport you over with it. I withdraw my claim. And Cyrano backs off, producing the little meatball from his pocket. On the Klingon ship, Koloth is gung-ho about letting this little monster loose on the Tribbles ASAP, but realizes Kirk has tricked him. This little glomer is no match for the mountain of a Tribble in the engine room, and it fucking bolts trying to get away. All we're missing are the Scooby-Doo running sounds. Back in the hallways, Doc McCoy has had time to figure out what Jones was really doing with these Tribbles. Turns out, he didn't think this through. Shocker. The giant tribbles are not tribbles at all. They're tribble colonies. Ugh. Doc quick whips up a chemical method of breaking down the colonies into their individual tribble components and goes about turning these mammoth fuzz piles into lots of little fuzz piles. But he swears that they won't be able to reproduce. So everything ought to be good? And we get the classic tribble gag, doubled up for our pleasure. The episode ends with Koloth and Kirk both up to the next in pom-poms. Cue the laugh track. Nope. The episode ends with Scotty offering a fuzzy pink pickle to Kirk, and he replies with the perviest eyebrow raise in the history of animation. I want this image in Shatner's obituary with no context. So let's start with you, bud. What'd you think of this lovely little jaunt through space? What a load. I knew I was in for a bad time when I could feel the episode padding suffocating the life out of the story. I think they slowed down Kirk's line sometimes just to stretch it to 22 minutes. The only good thing I might say about this episode is that I do love it when Star Trek does comedy. From the late 80s onward, they just never tried to do funny episodes. I mean, they touched on schlock sometimes, especially in the DS9 Mirror Universe episodes, but never flat out comedy. It was nice to see that again. I give it kudos for some new ship designs that I had never seen before, some clever moments from Kirk, but the, the pacing on this one just drags it straight down into the toilet. Despite all that, I give it two scoops of trouble for the callback ending. Yum. I completely agree. Listen, we all want a fuzzy buddy as a friend, but these guys ain't it. And I'm talking about the Tribbles. And having watched the Short Trek's origin story for these guys, thank you H. John Benjamin for making your place in Star Trek history by being a real big creepo. So yeah, any Tribble episode for me, two out of 10. But that is a very low rating. Yes, it is. Deserved. Yeah. Be sure to like and subscribe if you're out there. We're doing the hard work here watching these episodes and it would mean a lot to us and it would help the channel to grow. Next time on Taz Blasting, it's episode six, The Survivor. Ooh, intriguing. And, uh, hey, Roy, you got a little something on your... A little what, what? They're alive? Holy shit! Ugh.